Can people hear me? Wow, okay, perfect. So maybe, hey, let's get started. Um, so we're very lucky to have Dave Herman here from uh, Mozilla Research, who is the director of strategy for Mozilla Research. <laughs> I knew it was a director of some kind. I just wanted to make sure. Um, and he's been involved in, you know, a little language called Rust, which everybody takes a lot of inspiration from in this room, um, and a lot of other little pro little projects like Servo ASM. ASMJS is also one of the projects underneath the umbrella of Mozilla Research, so he's quite, uh, he's, you know, this, this organization has their hands in quite a few interesting and important open source projects, uh, and also uh, effective JavaScript. So if you use JavaScript, you probably read his book. Uh, so we're really lucky to have him here, and he's going to talk to us today a little bit about open source research lab at Mozilla. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Um, it's hard to tell if the mic is on. You can hear me? Yeah? OK. Um, all right, this is really exciting for me. Um, Curry On is, uh, uh, has a theme that, that speaks to me. Um, I, I really believe that research and practice have a lot to teach each other. Um, so uh, it's, but it's not easy. And I think, I think one of the reasons why it's hard for uh, the two worlds to talk to each other is they kind of start from different axioms, or um, they, have, they have different incentives behind what they're trying to do. So generally speaking, researchers uh, are rewarded for novelty. That's the thing that they're trying to do, is, is come up with new things. Um, and uh, if it can have impact, that's great. And I think basically everybody's here because you're interested in impact. But you're not necessarily rewarded for impact all the time. Um, and it's basically the opposite when it comes to, uh, to industry. In industry, like, we just have to survive to like, let our businesses live another day. Um, if that works with an old idea, if that works with a new idea, we honestly don't care as long as we survive. Um, but I'm here because I think that new ideas can also be one particular way uh, for us to, to succeed in industry. So the two have um, kind of can meet at the, at the point of novelty, but, um, but they don't always uh, know how to speak each other's languages. Um, also, I think my story is a little bit relevant because I started out in the academic world. I'm now in the industry world. I've sort of been on both sides of the fence. Or at least I, I was a baby academic. I got as far as, as my PhD. So I may still have kind of an infantile version uh, in my head of how research works. But I, at least I got a glimpse of, of how that works. Um, so really what I want to talk about today is my learning process going from the academic world uh, from uh, N years to a PhD, I'm not going to tell you uh, the value of N, um, to uh, about six and a half years now that I've been working full time at Mozilla. Um, and it's been a fascinating learning process for me to watch how my own axioms have shifted over the years, where I still have some of the things that I've learned from academia, but the things that I'm trying to accomplish are very different, and that's changed my thought process. Um, so, uh, when I came to Mozilla, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I'm not going to try to sell you some like crystalline gem of, of, a, of a model that came fully formed from my head. Um, all I knew when I came to Mozilla was that I had this intuition that uh, research and Mozilla's culture of open source, of open collaboration, um, might be able to work well together. I might be able to put that to good use for Mozilla. It might have strategic value for what Mozilla was trying to accomplish. And a few of us at Mozilla had some interesting experiments we wanted to try. So little by little, we started building what you might call uh, an open research lab. Um, uh, if this is a term, uh, I, I haven't really heard it before. I just basically coined the term. I'm just going to pretend like an open research lab is a thing, but it's my closest way of describing uh, what it is that we do. Um, so I'll just cut to the punchline. It's basically the thesis, thesis statement of this talk. Uh, an open research lab is uh, a research group that engages directly with the market, that works via open collaboration, and that uses these to close the feedback loop between ideas and practice and to close that feedback loop faster. Um, so that's basically what we do at Mozilla Research. Uh, and I think it's an interesting model. I don't claim at all that it's the only model for research. I think there are many important models. Uh, there are pros and cons to all of them. But I think this is one that's maybe underappreciated, underexplored. So it's one I want to talk to you a little bit about today. Um, 
and I think it's been pretty effective. So Heather mentioned some of these. Uh, uh, it's very kind of you. Um, I'm, I'm pretty proud of, of what we've accomplished at Mozilla. Uh, we have the Rust programming language, which is doing quite well. We have the uh, Servo browser engine, which is younger than Rust, but making good progress. Uh, we spearheaded the asm.js subset of JavaScript uh, and have been uh, playing a leadership role in the WebAssembly initiative. Uh, we also have an, an initiative that's uh, uh, working on patent unencumbered high quality video codecs. So we're not all about languages. I'm actually not going to talk about that one today, but I'm happy to talk to people more about that. And in fact, um, Michael Bebenita is here and uh, heavily involved in that project if anyone wants to hear more about that one. Um, so I think for a relatively small research lab with a pretty small budget, we've been able to accomplish some pretty big things. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we do what we do, uh, which means it's not going to be a very technical talk. This is really more about um, my way of thinking. Um, so that, that learning process that I talked about, um, I think for me, a lot of it centers around how do you actually get software adoption? Because what we're trying to do in engaging with the market in building open source ecosystems is actually build software for adoption. We're trying to do innovative things. We're trying to do research, but we're trying to do it by building real stuff that people really use. Um, so for me, coming from an academic background, a lot of this has been about learning how reality works, which I didn't know as much as I thought I did about. So I think of this as sort of discovering the laws of nature. Um, and the laws are not always pretty. Um, the law. The laws sometimes really contradict what I would like to be true. Um, and uh, what's, what part of what happens in that mental shift over time is instead of looking at these as necessary evils, you start to think of these as things you can actually use to your advantage. Um, so that's sort of a thing you'll see uh, in several of these laws. But I, I just want to jump in and, and start talking about what, what some of these laws that I've discovered are. Um, I'm sure that not everybody's going to agree with all of them, but um, I found them uh, to be pretty universally true in my experience. So let's get started with the first one. Uh, the law of progress. Um, so this law is about backwards compatibility. And uh, I used to think of backwards compatibility. I actually started working on JavaScript as an academic um, in grad school. I was working on uh, JavaScript standardization. and uh, anytime you're dropped in the middle of a real world technology and asked to help move it forward, the first thing that you think is, how on earth can we undo some of the mistakes that have already been made? Um, and it took me many, many years to get past this idea of thinking of backwards compatibility as this necessary evil that I put up with day after day after day that um, forced me to accommodate sins of the past and to think of it instead as a really powerful tool. So the rule here is that compatibility moves mountains. Um, one of the things that I've learned is that um, breaking changes are immensely costly. And it's really easy to undercount that cost. Um, when you're on the side of the divide between users and implementers, that is, the one who's responsible for the design, the one who's responsible for the implementation, you feel the pain of all of those warts uh, in many ways more than your users do. Because your users just code around them. They just get used to it. But you're the one who's stuck having to support that legacy mistake forever. And you really wish that you could change it. Um, but if you think instead from the user's perspective, if, if a user is offered a new feature and they're given a choice between you can have this new feature and you can keep all of your existing apps unchanged, or you can have this new feature and you have to throw everything that you've already done away and start from scratch, obviously they're going to choose the keep all of my apps working as they are uh, every single time. So there's huge power in convincing users to adopt a new thing uh, if it doesn't require them to give up something that already works for them before. Um, now, that may mean it, it, it imposes an extra cost for you as the designer. That may mean it, impose, as, it imposes an extra cost as an implementer. But it does mean that you'll be able to get adoption a whole lot faster. So um, there was a nice talk uh, from Peter O'Hearn uh, uh, a few days ago, or yesterday, about uh, the, the culture of move fast and break things. Um, there's kind of a, a, 
a sense in in the whole silicon valley culture that uh, everybody's constantly disrupting everybody else everybody's always throwing everything away and um, moving the old out uh, in, in to make room for the new um, but in fact in my experience that's not how the web works at all the web even has a slogan this is a, a slogan that is um, pretty entrenched in the entire uh, standards community for example and that slogan is don't break the web um, backwards compatibility is at the heart of how everything actually keeps moving forward. So there's no question that it has a cost, but backwards compatibility comes with enormous power. So the story uh, in our experience at Mozilla Research where I really took this to heart was the story of ASM.js. Um, so to give you a little bit of background of where ASM.js came out of, um, there was a constant desire for more performance out of the web platform, more capabilities, but in particular more per performance and more predictable performance to the point where people would build plugins that would allow them to uh, port native code or compile native code in a way that could run at very high speeds. Um, ActiveX was an older one. Um, the, one of the places where you really saw demand for this was in the games industry where they really wanted to push on getting as much performance out of the web platform as they could. So there were things like the Unity web player, which uh, was a plugin that allowed you to run Unity-based Unity, uh, Unity games on the web. So uh, there was an initiative uh, coming out of Google called Google Native Client, where they were trying to create, um, using some very cool technology, uh, a safe sandbox way to run high performance um, uh, native code embedded in the browser. And they were trying to push this into a standard. Now there were a number of concerns that Mozilla had about this technology at the time. There were actually several different browser vendors who were concerned about uh, this technology. It doesn't really matter the details. Um, but by and large, Google was putting a, a large amount of resources into building uh, pretty advanced technology, but they weren't getting um, the standards buy-in because the other browser vendors weren't interested. So it wasn't getting a lot of adoption. Um, at the same time, we were taking kind of a different approach at Mozilla Research. We started with, let's take the platform as it is and let's see how far we can push it. Let's see what we can do with it. So the first step in our process was Let's just take the browser as it is, the language JavaScript as it is, um, the APIs that are there, uh, and the JITs as they are. Just not even try to change any of the JavaScript engines. And let's try compiling native codes, native code to JavaScript and see where it falls down. So this was actually a personal project at first of my colleague Alon Zakai. Uh, he built this compiler called Emscripten, which compiled uh, C and C++ programs using uh, Clang as a front end um, into JavaScript, which is of course, ludicrous. Um, and it really was just two basic tricks that he used that worked to a much higher degree than, than he thought uh, possible um, and pretty much took everybody by surprise. The first trick was uh, you can represent the, the entire heap. You can rec represent the, the program store with uh, a binary blob using uh, the web's array buffer API. Pretty straightforward. That's simple enough. You can alias different kind of typed views onto that so that you can do 32-bit integers. You can do 32-bit, uh, 64-bit floating point. You get all the basic types that you need in a C program. OK, now you can manipulate the program store. So far, so good. The second trick was observing that uh, JavaScript, despite the fact that it doesn't have integers as a first class data type, it does have a few built in operators that operate on floating point numbers as if they were integers. So uh, by doing this bitwise or on a floating point number, if the number happens to be in, in, within the integer range of floating point numbers, uh, that's actually going to be a no op. But you get a, a, a guarantee from the result of that operation, which is you know for sure that the number that you have coming out the other end is a 32-bit integer. Again, represented as a floating point number. But now you actually have a type guarantee um, that you can even tell in a JIT compiler by inspection. You know for sure when you see OR0 that the thing that comes out the other end is going to be an integer. There's another sort of peephole observation you can make, which is that if I do, if I have two numbers that both of which I know to be integers, and I do an addition followed by immediately another or zero, bitwise or of zero, I know that the outcome is not only going to be guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be an integer, I know that the operation is precisely integer, 32-bit integer addition. So by combining these operators of JavaScript in a very particular way, you can actually know for sure that what you're doing corresponds exactly to the basic machine operations that C programs are doing. 
And it so happened that there were enough there was enough reasoning going on in JITs at the time that this was already actually pretty fast. So just the very first version of Emscripten happened to be tickling the fast paths of the JITs so that um, C++ compiled to JavaScript was sort of shockingly fast, like within an order of magnitude of the speed of a native program. Um, this, this worked well enough that it got our JIT engineers thinking, well, how could we actually push the boundaries of this? How could we actually provide ourselves with a guarantee that we'll get the performance that we want? So from there, uh, Luke Wagner um, had the insight that if we could recognize certain patterns of code as a sort of strange, insidious syntax for type annotations, we could actually treat this pattern of JavaScript as if it were a statically typed subset of the language that's effectively operating as a virtual machine, a low-level virtual machine. So uh, together, the three of us, uh, described this subset, which we called asm.js, and I provided the type rules. Now, this was not super advanced programming language theory. This was like first semester graduate student, my first type system level of, of types. The only sort of interesting part here is that the syntax is just totally bizarre. Just really to hammer that in, a type declaration in this language actually takes the form of a reassignment to a variable in the prologue of the body of the function with a no-op, so it's guaranteed to actually have no interesting uh, outcome in the program, but a no-op that comes with a type guarantee based on the semantics of JavaScript. So by saying p is, uh, is assigned p or 0, we're saying I want to assert that this is supposed to only be used with 32-bit integers. Um, the next sort of section of recognized syntax in asm.js is the local variable declarations. Uh, in this case, I, I believe we default to 32-bit integers, so I didn't have to do a type annotation via another of these no-op uh, casts. Um, then you have the function body, and then we have the return type annotation, again, by simply looking at the end of the function body, finding the return statement, and looking at the uh, coercion on the body. Uh, of the expression, you see what the return type of the function is. So this was our backwards compatible hack for recognizing a high performance subset of JavaScript that could be used as a compiler target. So the, the next step that we, that we pulled was to put an ahead of time validator in the, the JIT of our JavaScript engine so that we could recognize these patterns and say, if we can actually validate via type checking that you're in this subset of the language, we can actually go to a effectively the best possible code gen path you could get. And at that point, we started being able to get our performance differential from native code down to, uh, first it was about 2x of native speed. We got down to about 1.5x of native speed. We've been pushing it down further and further. So we're getting like, we're closing the window between the speed of running a native executable on a Windows machine and running JavaScript code compiled via LLVM uh, from C++ passed through a JIT with an ahead of time validator squirting out machine code on the other end and doing this all on the fly in a web browser and it's almost the same speed. So this was a, a very impressive outcome it's also syntactically disgusting. We were, <laughs> we had no misgivings about this, um, but you know, our thought was, hey, this is just this is intended for code generators anyway. This is int intended for humans to write. So, who really cares about how how pretty it is? So, this worked great. We got fantastic performance results, but we also got results in uh, in practice. We got results in the industry. So, um, one of the first big uh, coups was that uh, the Unity uh, game engine announced that they would be shipping a version of the game engine that worked via asm.js uh, without, any, without the need for any plugins. And so that's really the key for them. That, that one little bit, um, this, the, they refer to it as a barrier-free experience, that's, um, that's code for we, Unity, are going to get better adoption from this. If we don't need to require our users to install a plugin, that's one less obstacle our users have to go through in order to make use of this. So what we'd managed to do at Mozilla Research was, by hook or by crook, we found a way to allow people to compile their code for the web, get 
uh, acceptable performance for even the most demanding games and do it in a way that got them better adoption and without the need for standardization, without the need for plugins. And that's the thing that Native Client wasn't able to accomplish. Uh, the next step was the, uh, the, uh, the Epic game engine made a similar announcement, again, without the friction of plugins. Again, friction, that's one of those code words for we're going to get more users out of this. Um, okay, so, so this brings us to the next law. This is a law that probably everybody in this room has heard before. Uh, worse is better. I'm not sure if Dick is in the room. I think I saw him in the hallway. Uh, so Dick Gabriel wrote a, a famous letter to the Lisp community in 1991. Um, sort of haranguing them for taking the wrong approach to adoption. Um, and I have probably read this essay dozens of times in my life. It gave me heartburn almost every time I read it. I didn't want it to be true. Um, I think probably most of us here believe in our hearts that quality matters. I know I do. Quality is a big part of why I do what I do. And here is this article telling me that the worst thing is going to win out over the better thing. And how, how, how could I possibly fit that in my head? Um, it's actually a pretty challenging article. I think uh, I, I feel like the last few times I've read it, I've been getting more insight into what he's actually saying. Um, there's a lot of details that I think aren't actually that critical. I think there's really, there's really two things that are the most important thing. One is he's saying, he's not saying you know, worse code is better than better code. He's saying that a particular strategy has better survival characteristics than aiming for the right thing in the beginning. That's a descriptive thing. That's not a, that's not normative. That's just, he's describing reality. Again, these, these are laws of nature, right? Um, the second one is, it's undes often undesirable to go for the right thing first. It's better to get half of the right thing available so that it spreads like a virus. Once people are hooked on it, take the time to improve it to 90% of the right thing. So this is a far more optimistic view of that article than just the idea of you should ship whatever crap you come up with and um, you know, maybe if you're first to market, you'll win. So when you look at it from that perspective, he's actually saying, I think, a much less controversial thing. He's really just saying this. Beware of waterfall. Waterfall is dangerous. And we know this, right? We all know that iterative processes work better than big upfront design. I think this is actually not a particularly controversial thing in our industry anymore. Um, the, way I look about, the way I think about this is the iterative process is a learning process, and I think all software is about learning. Um, and there's actually a concept that uh, this maps to directly in, uh, in philosophy called the hermeneutic circle, uh, not related to my name. Um, this, th I think it originally came out of uh, religion. It's, uh, it's been used in interpretation, in epistemology. Uh, the basic idea of the hermeneutic circle is you understand the whole in terms of the parts, but you understand the parts better when you have an understanding of the whole, which means that the understanding process can actually go through multiple uh, iterations and you can get deeper and uh, better understanding each time you go through that process. Um, it's also sometimes called the hermeneutic spiral, which I think is a nicer way of showing that it can actually approximate a fixed point. Um, if you just think of it as a circle, you might never know when to stop. Um, but that's what I think worse is better is really ultimately about. It's about you don't know what the best thing is. You actually, you may be aspiring to come up with the right thing, but you don't even know what it's going to be. So you're better off finding a way to get something that people really want, get it into their hands, and get useful feedback about what works and what doesn't work so that you can improve on your ideas and have a better next turn around the loop. Um, and that's really what we experienced with Asm.js. So I think there's no doubt that Asm.js was a worse is better solution compared with Native Client. Native Client had a custom binary format. Uh, it was informed by work that came out of LLVM. Um, you know, it was really sort of there's an intuition everybody had of if you're going to design a binary payload for the web, gzipping JavaScript is clearly not the right thing, and you know creating an actual uh, binary format is. But we found a way of actually getting something that could get shipped. We actually found out um, what was effective, what what parts of the design could be made efficient, where the where the issues were, and that allowed us to. Um, then get together with the other browser vendors and say, okay, we have something that works. Now let's all work together to build on it. So the next step of the process was the WebAssembly project. 
Um, and WebAssembly has really been a uh, remarkably successful consensus-driven standards process. Um, so here you see uh, one of the early WebAssembly demos. This one's running in Firefox, but it was actually a coordinated release with uh, Firefox, uh, Chrome, and I believe IE as well. I think they all announced on the same day that they had uh, preliminary working versions. Um, so you can see now WebAssembly is uh, a GitHub organization. Um, you can actually see nice pictures of people who work at multiple browser companies and people who don't work at browser companies at all. Um, so it's a, it's a very healthy process. Um, and the aim is roughly by the end of this year to have a first shipping version in, in multiple browsers. People aren't making a, an absolute commitment to that, but that's the rough timeline. And you can see they've gotten religion about iteration. Their first goal is a minimum viable product. The actual thing that they're aiming for initially is um, roughly equivalent functionality to asm.js. So asm.js, I think, was really a key stepping stone to getting to a place where we could design an actual custom binary format that could have faster load time, that could be better designed, that could allow us to create custom debugging formats so that you could have a better debugging experience. So this is allowing us to have a second iteration that will be much better in a lot of ways than asm.js, um, but where we have something working and shipping to the web all along. And at the same time, iteration does not have to mean unambitious. There's plenty more places that WebAssembly can go, and the people involved in the WebAssembly process are really interested in um, uh, very big ambitious goals like s better support for dynamic and high level languages, um, integrating with the garbage collectors that are shipping in, in browser engines, possibly even evolving those garbage collectors to be concurrent um, so that you could really have all, basically all threaded um, uh, garbage collected programming languages, um, shipping high performance, high quality experiences on the web. Um, we even have sort of more wild eyed uh, crazy ideas like could we re-architect a, a, a production JavaScript engine so that its um, highest tier, highest performing JIT backend is actually generating WebAssembly instead of native code? A, so that we can reuse the code generation. B, so that we reduce the trusted computing base of the browser so that the only thing that's generating native code is a very high quality WebAssembly implementation. But C, can we do that without loss of performance? So that's going to require some pretty advanced techniques for figuring out how to take this safe assembly language and allow it to be as fast as an unsafe assembly language. So we might need techniques like typed assembly language for doing that. So just the, the last sort of parting thought about worse is better is Dick also makes a point of saying at the end of the, uh, the article, uh, a wrong lesson is to take the parable literally and to conclude that C is the right vehicle for AI software. The 50% solution has to be basically right, and in this case it isn't. But this is an important point, right? I mean, this idea of can we get something that actually ships and that is viral and that allows us to kickstart the hermeneutic circle, um, it has to be at least plausible. It has to be good enough that people can actually get value out of that. So, so the next law is really addressing the question of what happens when it's not good enough yet. Um, so this law is sort of bizarrely named the ugly baby and the hungry beast. Um, this, these are not my terms. This comes from a book by Ed Catmull. He was the um, founder and president of Pixar uh, and is also the president of Walt Disney Animation Studios. He wrote a really nice book called Creativity Inc. that talks about the creative process and um, how, th how they do. It's not, it's not exactly necessarily a research book, but I found it very relevant to thinking about the process of research. Um, and he has this maybe strained metaphor of uh, the life cycle of an idea. And he, he talks about how in the context of a company that has well-oiled machines, which he calls the hungry beast, this beast is has a particular way of doing things. It's very uh, optimized for efficiency. You have a lot of people who have a very clear understanding of what their job is. Um, and they know particular ways of doing things. Um, but Given a new idea, a new idea that maybe doesn't work the same way as the way they've always done things before, that idea is often likely either to get just shredded and destroyed or distorted into something that uh, is really unrecognizable to um, what it w where it was trying to go. There's a sense that these machines like production teams at a production company um, aren't really prepared for a new idea that may be fragile and it may not, you, without the protection of the, 
the people who are still trying to figure out what this idea is, um, it, it just might not be ready to feed into the beast. Um, so this was our experience with uh, a language um, that um, Heather mentioned, which I think is a, a very excellent language, the, the Rust programming language. But uh, Rust went through a long route to get where it is today. And there's no question that uh, in the early days, uh, Rust was pretty unrecognizable compa compared to where it is now. It really was the, the ugly baby. OK, so just quickly, what's Rust about? Um, I would love to talk in more detail about the, de uh, you know, the technical details of Rust, um, but I just don't have time tonight. Um, so I'm just going to give you the very high level pitch. OK, from the website, it says, Rust is a systems programming language that runs blazingly fast, prevents seg faults, and guarantees thread safety. Um, at, at kind of a, um, the level of, of intention of why was, it, why was Mozilla interested in a technology like this, um, basically, there's been a, uh, a tension between speed and control over performance and safety since time immemorial in programming languages. And it's a terrible Faustian bargain. Um, especially when you're put in particular competitive environments where even the slightest bit of performance loss can mean death in the market. In those kinds of uh, contexts, um, when faced with a choice between speed and safety, programmers will choose speed every time. Um, so we wanted a language that would allow us to build a competitive, high-performance web browser. Firefox is our flagship product. Um, but one that allowed us to move past the state of the art of writing you know, r on roughly on the order of 10 million lines of C++ code to build one of the world's most important software platforms. Um, so there are a lot of secret weapons uh, inside of, of Rust. There's a lot of really interesting research under the hood. Um, a lot of it is known ideas. A lot of it is sort of new takes on known ideas or interesting combinations of known ideas. Um, there's some really, I think, novel ideas in there as well. Um, so there are things like affine types, uh, region-based memory management, um, ownership, uh, uh, tr transfer of ownership, and temporary borrowing of ownership. These are sort of key concepts that the type system tracks that allows you to do um, manual memory management in a way that is actually guaranteed to be safe. Um, we use type classes, which actually surprised me at first. I was sort of resistant to it for a while, but it turned out to be a, a perfect fit. Um, algebraic data types and pattern matching, that was just kind of a slam dunk from, from day one. Everybody was clear that we wanted that. Um, although there's some interesting ways in which that interacts with a language with explicit memory management that are not obvious. Uh, inherited mutability is one of the more interesting pieces. Again, I wish I had time to talk about all the technical details. This is really just to show there's a lot of non-trivial technology going on in Rust to make it actually able to accomplish what it does. And really, the point of this is it was super, super hard. This took us many years to get to. Um, so we, Mozilla first sponsored the creation of a small team um, to work on Rust full time in the very beginning of 2010. That was actually right when I joined Mozilla. It was two years before we even had the first 0.1 tarball released to the, to the world. And that, that version of Rust itself was just utterly different from where we are today. And it was another three years after that before we finally got to Rust 1.0 final. Uh, which is the point at which we made strong backwards compatibility guarantees. Um, so you can see a five-year process from inception to release. A lot happens <laughs> in five years. A lot happens not just technically in five years, a lot happens culturally in five years. If you build a team that's given time to go off and do something on their own um, with great protection so that the ugly baby survives, um, that team can get quite divorced from the rest of your organization. Um, and we all know a famous cautionary tale of what happened when you, you take a team, you, you set them off to do really cool things, and you let them work completely independently from the rest of your company. Park in the 70s, Xerox Park in the 70s, was famous for generating way more cool ideas than we have at Mozilla Research, um, but uh, just a million great research ideas, and then not ever getting them adopted within their own company. In fact, a lot of those ideas were um, in danger of never getting to the rest of the world at all. There's the famous story about Steve Jobs coming in for one day and getting all sorts of ideas that led to the Macintosh. Um, so uh, Bob Metcalf uh, was actually one of those researchers at the time. And I think um, I, I found this really fascinating quote from him. Um, I think uh, it had to have been partly based on his experience working uh, at Xerox Park. He says, Real companies can't afford to do research other than monopolies. 
Uh, and then for years, AT&T is a monopoly sat on innovation. IBM after that and Xerox after that. So let's kill those monopolies and have research done at research universities. Uh, he went on to say, we worry about technology transfer. How do you get technology transferred from the lab into the marketplace? This is very much the theme of, of Curry On. And he says, the best way to do that is with people. And it's the business of universities to graduate people. So his thesis was, industry R&D doesn't work. We should do our R&D purely in universities. Um, it was also interesting, this was in the context, um, uh, they were saying, you're, you, we understand that your politics are libertarian, and yet you did all of this, uh, this, this work with government-funded research. Do you see this as a problem? And his answer was, no, it's actually so valuable that this is one of the things, even as a libertarian, I think is uh, important for uh, the government to fund. So my experience uh, is, is far more positive. Uh, my experience is, A, Mozilla is most definitely not a monopoly. Uh, we're not even that big of a company, and we have a pretty small budget, and we've managed to do some innovative work and actually get it out into the market. So uh, Rust has a uh, community package manager uh, called Cargo, and it's still fairly young. The numbers are fairly low, but you can see about 55 million downloaded packages, a little over 5,000 packages in the ecosystem today. Um, we're only about a year into uh, being a 1.0 language, so pretty good numbers. The, the, um, the numbers are steadily increasing. So we're seeing you know, good community adoption, uh, healthy number of companies that are making use of Rust. So Rust is really happening in the world. Um, and the really key differentiator here is just open source. The fact that we didn't have to wait for company buy-in to be able to ship something. We put something out there and people got excited about it in the world and they're using it. And we're also able to put that to advantage internally within our own company. A little slogan I always remind my team of, nothing succeeds like success. Um, so even before we were shipping 1.0, we were still actually shipping, right? We were getting people sort of little by little, started with hobbyists, but more and more people talking about Rust, getting excited about Rust, using Rust. It was being seen more and more as a success. The more that was seen as a success, more, the more Mozilla could feel like this is our success. This is a good thing for Mozilla. And the more developers were getting excited about it. Developers within Mozilla were getting excited about it. So I really see this as a bottom-up adoption strategy within my own company, that you had a bunch of developers who were excited about the technology. They were excited as Mozillians to, uh, to see this as a success. And they started talking to their bosses and saying, hey, how can I start using Rust for my day job? Um, so in fact, it got to the point where we didn't even have to go sell it to anyone else at the company. People just came to us and they said, we want to start shipping Rust. Uh, what do we need to do to make this happen? Um, so there's a lot of technical boring stuff that you have to do to get that happen. You have to work with your release engineering team and you have to figure out Linux distros and all sorts of boring details, which we went through that process. Um, so I was very excited to be able to finally announce to the world last week, uh, I wrote this blog post here, um, that we are shipping our first Rust implemented component in production in Firefox with Firefox version 48. So um, it's really happening. Mozilla's really adopted Rust. Um, but we were able to do that without having to get buy-in first from the rest of the company, even with a long prelude to get to that point, five years of, of incubation. OK, so on to the next challenge. Um, I'm talking about doing adoption with a tiny research team. Um, so you know, how, how is this actually possible? How is it actually possible with a small team of researchers that we can build a 1.0 programming language product? This is just a massive amount of work. And the answer to that is it's impossible without a community. There's, there's absolutely no way to do this without an open source community. Um, and in fact, I, um, I pushed very hard for a long time to make sure that Rust, while being sponsored by Mozilla, was not owned by Mozilla. And I think that's a very, um, maybe a subtle uh, difference of the use of English language, but I think it's a really big difference in terms of people in the community perceiving their ability to be first class members of the project. Um, and in particular, we have a core team leadership structure that is completely independent of employment at Mozilla. Um, and as a director in the, in the research department, I've made sure that we don't have any decision-making status. Nobody at Mozilla, unless they are actually a member of the core team, has any decision-making status on the project. So the next law is really all about community. 
and that could be the subject of one or even many more talks. Um, I've learned many things about community over the years. So I, I don't really have time to go into a complete community model, but I'll, I'll just get at the one most important law. This is the law of why wasn't I consulted. So this is a quote from a blog post by a guy named Paul Ford. He wrote, why wasn't I consulted is the fundamental question of the web. It is the rule from which all other rules are, der are derived. Well, he doesn't say all, but I might say all. Uh, humans have a fundamental need to be consulted, engaged, to exercise their knowledge and thus power, and no other medium that came before has been able to tap into that as effectively. So he wasn't talking about open source at all. He was just talking about the title of the, of the blog post was The Web as a Customer Service Medium. It's a really thought-provoking article. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, but that slogan, why wasn't I consulted, um, rang so true for me. It, it, it really represents basically the heart of almost all conflict that I ever see uh, involved in an open source project. So, uh, got to hurry on here, sorry. Um, so I'll just briefly mention um, uh, one other person that's been very influential on me. This this somebody who actually worked at Mozilla before I did. I never met him. Uh, Frank Hecker um, talked about open source communities as deliberative democracies, and he talked about how to handle disagreements in open collaborative projects. Um, the the key insight that he has here is that our goal should be to make decisions that stick. This is all about uh, decision making through communities. Um, and he describes something called the rule of reciprocity. Um, the basic idea is you justify your decision in terms that others who disagree with you can potentially accept. This is a little bit of a mouthful, but the basic idea is you're working together with people who have varied ideas, varied philosophies, varied values, and you're trying to conserve the amount of disagreements. You're, you're trying to decrease the amount of disagreement possible and find ways for people to be able to come to consensus, even if they might not all have the exact same idea about where you should go. Uh, a, a sort of key corollary that Aaron Turan of the, of the Rust team discovered was what he called the no new rationale rule, which is the core team are leaders, they're responsible for making decisions ultimately, but anytime they make a decision and they announce it based on rationale that has not yet been publicly vetted, everything goes south, everything falls apart, people freak out. But if they announce it based only on rationale that has already been part of the discussion, has already been debated, people are able to accept it even if they didn't necessarily agree with it. I know that's not enough. There's so much I could say about uh, community. There's all sorts of other parts of the community model, but uh, I'm running out of time. So one last law. Um, this law is invariance, our shared values. Uh, got a little nod to Matthias here. So uh, Matthias wrote a paper that was very, um, uh, had an impact on me called On the Expressive Power of Programming Languages, um, where he describes, I, the way I think of it is programming, lang programming language design is inherently a tension between expressive power, allowing people to avoid uh, repeated programming patterns, basically syntactic abstraction, um, versus local reasoning and extra invariance. And there's no one point on the spectrum that's the right answer for all cases. It's, it's a continuous challenge for every language that you design to figure out how much power do we need to allow people to say what they need to say, but without going so far that it starts ruining people's ability to, do, to, to reason about their programs. And the, the fact is that no matter what, no matter what language you design, there will all be, always be cases where you need to give people some expressive power that is going to hurt some invariance that you wish held of all programs. A key example of this in Rust is unsafe. Rust we call a safe programming language, and yet we have this unsafe escape hatch that lets you violate all of the invariants of the language. Um, I'll also point out that Rust is not at all alone. In fact, every programming language ever has the ability to do this. Haskell has unsafe perform IO, OCaml has object.magic, uh, com.sun.unsafe in Java. Everybody has some sort of an escape hatch to violate all the invariants of the language. So um, this is not a mistake. This is not us making a bad decision. This has allowed an ecosystem to build things that no one single small team could do on their own. Um, so these are just three examples. Actually, the top one is my side project. Um, these are all language bridges, or in Node's case, yeah, they're, they're all language bridges, right? So Neon is a bridge uh, that allows Node programmers to call into Rust. Helix is a bridge that allows Ruby programmers to call into Rust. And Rustler is a bridge that allows Erlang programmers to call into Rust. These all inherently rely on having access to the FFI. Um, 
but now we are depending on the entire ecosystem to play by some rules in order not to destroy all of the guarantees that Rust tries to promise to all of its users. So what's the answer? The answer can't be that we must always protect all invariants in the programming language because then we couldn't do this. So the answer there is you have to instill some shared values in your ecosystem. And that really comes down to messaging. That's part of the role of leaders in an open source project. Um, and that's been a huge uh, amount of work that the Rust team has put into learning how to talk about Rust, learning how to message the, val the core values of the language in such a way that um, nobody in the, in the community would ever blink an eye at someone saying, hey, you made a mistake, that's not safe, you need to fix it. They wouldn't say, well, who cares, I can do whatever I want. They would say, oops, yes, I made a mistake, that violates the invariance of Rust. Um, so what the Rust team has put a lot of, of effort into is figuring out what does Rust represent? And this was a really nice blog post they wrote um, a few months ago where they talked about how prior to 1.0, they spent a lot of time figuring out how to reach clarity on what Rust represents. And they really narrowed it down. They, they, they talked about all of these different shared values, memory safety without garbage collection, concurrency without data races, abstraction without overhead, stability without stagnation. And they crystallized that down to one slogan, hack without fear, that actually really encapsulates a lot of the, the core values. Okay, so I'm pretty much out of time, so I don't think I'm going to spend too much time on a negative example. Uh, I just wanted to point out that I'm not trying to claim that everything that we've ever done has worked. In fact, we did have one project, which was a super cool project, but didn't ever make the cut. Uh, it didn't make it into production. This was a, a self-hosted implementation of the Flash um, uh, platform uh, using nothing but web technology. Um, if I had more time, I'd point out that if you look at these different laws, we really didn't exploit many of them. We weren't able to put those to use. And you could see that it sort of failed to get buy-in within the company. Um, and I'll just point out briefly that we have another project, Servo, which is younger. And I think it's already making good use of, of, of some of these laws. And I think there's more things that we can do. Uh, so this is a little screen cap that we made recently showing that Servo is making real progress. You can browse some real websites with it. Once you get through load time, our network stack isn't really fully implemented yet. Once you get through the initial download, you can see it's very snappy, it scrolls very nicely. So Servo is making great progress. Um, and uh, we're able to go into this with six years of, of experience of having learned how to do um, you know, re research that's trying to get adoption. Um, so my last parting thought is uh, this is a work in progress. This is my mental model as I see it today. I don't claim it'll work for everybody. I don't even know if it will work for anybody other than us. I know that Mozilla is uniquely positioned to do open source research. Um, and of course, all, model, all models are wrong, as we know. The question is, are they useful? And for Mozilla Research, I think it's been going pretty well. Thank you very much. I'm not sure how over we are. Thanks. Um, I have a question uh, here. Ah, there, OK. Um, was it a lot of discussion before this table release? What should g uh, get uh, in that, and what what should uh, be thrown away? And afterwards, when uh, you get a stable version and you weren't able to break things that often as uh, you would like to, uh, like like you did before before a stable version, was there some regrets that you brought something that you, okay? Can you <laughs> tell about yes, those? Yes, it's um, so uh, if you're not experiencing tremendous tremendous pain in releasing a 1.0, you're probably too late. Um, that's sort of part of the worse is better uh, uh, takeaway. Uh, even after five years, there was still um, a lot of heartache around what had to get cut that people really wanted and what had to go in knowing that it really wasn't the way we'd want it to be. Uh, and I, I would be really dishonest as a person whose PhD is in macros if I didn't stand up here and openly admit that the macro system being shipped in the state that it was was one of the regrets. Um, so, and everybody knew this. Everybody knew that the macro system was not where we wanted it to be. Um, there's, you know, one of the things that happens uh, with backwards compatibility constraints is you end up with multiple versions of things. So it's quite possible we'll have two macro systems uh, in the grand scheme of things. Um, no pun intended, and we wouldn't be the first language to have two macro systems. So um, that, you know, that's one of the issues. Uh, there are some aspects of 
uh, of the um, the interaction with unsafe code that Nico Matsakis, who's one of the leads of the project, has told me that he regrets. Um, you know, ultimately, it's about can you squeeze every last drop out of uh, of performance out of code that's mixing safe and unsafe code. So that's not unrecoverable. There are, there are things you can do, like pull the unsafe code out of the module into a separate module. Um, but yeah, there's there's always regrets, um, and uh, th a lot of those. But, but all of those discussions were happening within the community. So everybody was collectively coming together to decide what's in, what's out. And some of those were more painful than others, for sure. Um, OK, so the question is, uh, it's kind of a little bit of a story first. So there was this paper in 2013 at Uppsala about the sociological sort of adoption of programming languages. <laughs> Uh, by uh, Leo Myrovich and uh, yeah. uh, Avi Rabkin. And um, in this paper, the basic, like the main point was, well, look at all of these languages. Um, the most important thing in their adoption is like some kind of big ecosystem, uh, libraries and things existing. And then you can look at uh, languages like Clojure and Scala and say, well, probably a huge part of their adoption is the fact that it's JVM ecosystem. You can just use Java libraries. So maybe this has something to do with like the rapid adoption of these languages, yet Rust is kind of counterintuitive to that because there was no huge ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Can you, I mean, it's sort of, you know, make is it, it's opposite to what the paper says, kind of. It's somehow being adopted without this ecosystem. So uh, do you have any intuition or, or can you make some explanation about why this is happening? I certainly can. Um, uh, I'll try to keep it short. Um, first, I think uh, I, I um, I should say Leo is a friend. Um, I think he does awesome work. Uh, he has given us a lot of ideas for Servo. Uh, but I think his paper is asking the wrong question. I think it's kind of like saying, what is the strategy that makes businesses work? It, it, it depends, right? It depends on the market they're in. It depends on what they're trying to accomplish. Um, certainly, um, having access to an existing ecosystem is one particular tactic that can be effective. Um, but I think really, you know, for, for any technology, there has to be some value proposition that's so compelling that people are willing to do something new. And in the case of Rust, I think we actually probably easily, I think we easily could have failed. I think one of the pivotal moments for us was in 2013, Patrick Walton wrote a blog post. He's one of the members of the team. He wrote a blog post saying effectively, holy cow, we actually don't need to lean on the garbage collector. We had like this um, intention of having a garbage collector all along. And we had these sigils in the language that meant this is a garbage collected value. But it was actually implemented with a half broken reference counter um, because we just hadn't gotten around to it. But we always had this belief that you know, by default, you'll do garbage collection. And in the, you know, in the cases where you can manage it, you'll yeah. do stack allocation or you'll do uh, you know, l linear usage or affine usage. Um, and Patrick started doing some experiments where he was like, wait, I can write entire programs without using the garbage collected um, types. And maybe we can actually evolve this in a direction where you don't need to lean on the garbage collector at all. I think that was a pivotal moment because I think that was when people realized this is a quote unquote real systems language. And for the first time, it was like, you can do the same stuff you can do in C and C++, but with actual safety. And that's a truly novel thing. That's a, um, the, the other aspect that I'll mention is uh, t two more. Two more. <laughs> There's a lot that goes into this. Um, so one of them is uh, uh, Kathy Sierra is somebody I, I, I look up to a lot. She, she talks about um, software adoption and, and marketing. Um, and she, if you'll forgive my French, she talks about um, user badassery. Uh, how can you make your users badass? And I think that there is a sense um, that uh, Rust combines two elements of user badassery that like makes you such a super badass that it's just really compelling. One is that you get to do these newfangled, um, you know, super advanced um, type things like Haskell. Like we've got the we've got the badassery of Haskell that comes from type classes and you know big, big mouthfuls like substructural type systems. The other badassery is that you get to do systems programming, and that's a thing that's traditionally seen as a you know as relegated to a very tiny cabal of of super hacker wizards. Um, so the fact that you can do both of those things and that because it's safe, it's not as scary. 
Um, that's partly why I think Hack Without Fear is a, is a message that's resonating with people. Um, so, so we're bringing a level of badassery that lets you, lets you do new things. At the same time, there's a challenge that people have of like, well, what should I do? Okay, I'm excited to, to become one of those badasses, but I need, to, I need an idea for a project. So that's the thing we need, I think, to help people on. The final piece I'll mention is package management. I think package management is one of those things. People have talked about tools a lot these past couple of days. Um, package management has become a um, basic requirement of programming languages, and I think um, not all languages are quite catching up to this fact, not, not recognizing this fact. Um, and we had the incredible good fortune of um, being able to work with um, Carl Lurch, who has been here. I don't know if he's here tonight, but uh, he's been here these past couple of days. Carl Lurch and Yehuda Katz, who had both designed the Bundler package manager for Ruby, um, they helped to design the Cargo package manager for Rust, which has been a huge success. So when you talk about ecosystem, um, part of the problem of starting fresh is you're bootstrapping an ecosystem. And package managers are a really great way to help um, facilitate that bootstrapping process. Um, and it becomes one of those, um, the, the hope is that it becomes one of those self-fulfilling things, that the bigger that sort of nascent ecosystem gets, the bigger it gets again. Um, I think probably the, the, the first time I was made aware of this idea was uh, the first time I saw CPAN. Um, and it just, it just was, was totally clear to me that creating a single place where people can come together to share code is going to make the growth of the ecosystem visible and give people a sense of the momentum behind it. So those are, those are some short answers, the, uh, some long answers. The short answer is I think every language is different. I think the strategy for every language is different and you have to find what the core value proposition is and it's not as easy as a single answer in a, in a single paper. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> I think there's a question over here. Yeah. yeah. So how did you manage to keep Rust as the ugly baby, like under the radar for five years? <laughs> what were you feeding the beast in the meantime? Uh, good question. Um, so, uh, you know, part of it was the good fortune of having a couple of champions at the time. Um, my boss, Andreas Gall, had co-founded Mozilla Research with me, along with Brendan Eich, who was his boss um, and was CTO at the time. And Brendan really championed um, Mozilla Research and Rust in particular um, at the executive level. So there was a real sense of we had a strong executive protector behind us. Um, in some ways, those days are behind us. Uh, Andreas and Brendan are both gone from Mozilla, um, but we have a pretty good portfolio at this point. We're starting to have some credibility within the organization. So people are starting to believe that, okay, maybe these people know what they're doing. Maybe we should let them try their experiments. Um, although I wouldn't say that we have any projects at the scale or scope of Rust or Servo starting on day one right now. Uh, we have kind of, we're, we're juggling a lot of things right now. Um, so it sort of remains to be seen for the next really big uh, project that we decide to take on. How long of a runway will we, will we be given? It's, it's, it's not clear. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi, I've been following Rust for a while and uh, V1 released, it was amazing, everybody was super happy, you threw a party and everything I remember. Um, I wanted to ask, what are you expecting of the future of Rust in embedded systems or maybe in, in mobile development, which is my specialty. So um, we, uh, when you're talking to people, they are expecting to have some kind of multi-platform code that you're able to load. And right now, C and C++ are an option because it, they come with too much overhead. So maybe Rust could be one of the alternatives. Overhead in the sense um, of um, developer men overhead. Yes, mental yes, okay. overhead. <laughs> right. No, absolutely. I think that's a, a. I think mobile development is. I mean, it's it's not just um, hypothetical. There's a lot of people who are interested in it and and working on it. Um, I think I just heard this week actually. So Dropbox is one of our early um, adopters, and uh, their original use of Rust <coughs> was uh, in server farms, but. Um, I think I just heard that they're starting to look into using it for, for mobile development. Um, there, there's, there's basically a few pieces of infrastructure that you need and you just have to build it and that's in progress. So one of the main ones, which is a, a kind of top priority right now, is having really, really smooth uh, cross-compilation workflows. Um, so uh, if you're, if you're going to do mobile development, it needs to be really trivial to be able to build it and deploy it to your uh, test devices. Um, and that's just, that's work in progress, but it's going really well. Um, uh, but the, the more general question of like which, 
which adoption areas do we think are going to be the best? There's a huge list, and there's a bunch of people exploring different areas. Um, I don't think it's going to be the same kind of straightforward story as something like Node, where it's like, you write servers. That's what Node is for. It's for servers. But servers are such a huge uh, market that all you need is that one thing, and it'll be huge. I think with Rust, it's probably going to be more like a bunch of different things. And I think that servers will eventually become a bigger and bigger market for, for Rust. But I think in the beginning, it's going to be people who are really trying to squeeze every last ounce of performance out. So you're going to see people who are doing you know, massive server farms where they can save on uh, power consumption. They can save on the number of devices that they need to use, um, where they're really trying to push on performance. But I think ultimately, as the ecosystem starts to build better abstractions, better uh, frameworks, um, you know, put them on crates.io, our, our um, package ecosystem, it'll start to be easier and easier to piece together smaller server apps. And then you'll start seeing people say, well, hey, it's actually pretty convenient to use Rust even for a smaller app. It doesn't have to be, I don't have to be shipping to a huge server farm today. And now I know that because I've written it in Rust, uh, it'll be able to scale up to the big server farm tomorrow. There's all sorts of other things. There are like high frequency trading companies that are looking at it. There's people doing machine learning. Um, there's people looking at uh, crypto because they're really interested in the safety guarantees. Um, so there's a lot of different areas that people are interested in for us. Um, I think it's always a safe bet that if you can if you can start getting on servers, though, you're 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 going to get pretty solid adoption. So I, I think uh, I think we should thank Dave. <laughs> And just to say a few things to sort of wind down the whole event. Uh, first of all, I have to thank everybody who is here because I, I sent out this wonky email that was like, you guys got to ask questions. Everybody comes from totally different backgrounds. Somebody has no idea what a type system is. They've never heard about it. They've, their first language was something that they, they made themselves. They, they don't know any of this stuff. So somebody, if somebody asks, help them. Uh, and I really saw a lot of that. There were a lot of people who were really just asking totally honest questions and not totally unafraid. People who seemed very quiet and not the kind of person to ask questions were asking questions. So I want to thank everybody for making it a good environment so that that could happen. So please give yourselves a round of applause for doing that. <laughs> also, I want to say a few words about how this conference kind of works. So it's actually really largely a volunteer thing. Um, the way that this whole thing works, it's totally not for profit. Um, you, the University of, I, I don't know how to say it properly, Sapienza, the, the University of Rome, uh, they organized all of this local stuff. They organized that amazing party that you all went to. Uh, you know, this was totally just different groups of people from different places organizing this thing to make it cool. And uh, the money that, that, you know, came in that, that didn't cover, that was a little bit extra than the costs, that went to covering students and underrepresented groups from tech here at the event. So it's a little bit of a weird event. And a lot of people had to just volunteer tons of time to make it happen. Uh, so again, I want to thank all the local organizers and everybody else who put a lot of time and energy into this. Thank you to all of them. I don't know if they're all in the room, but thank you. <laughs> and finally, um, they're tonight at 9 o'clock. Um, I don't know, does anybody know where it's starting from? There are some Rome walks, roaming around Rome. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where the starting point is, but there, you can sign up. Um, the, I, I believe it's the, the folks from the local folks are going to be taking people around, showing them around the city. Uh, so if you're interested in, in a little walking tour when the weather is cooler outside, uh, you can sign up at the registration desk, and I'm sure there will be instructions about the meeting point. So go have a look at that if you're interested. And uh, uh, I have some more curry on stickers and one, one women's t-shirt left. So <laughs> ladies who didn't get a shirt, please come to me. Uh, but that's it. Thanks for coming. And I hope to see you guys in Barcelona next year. I haven't really heard it before. I just basically coined the term. 
I'm just going to pretend like an open research lab is a thing, but it's my closest way of describing uh, what it is that we do. Um, so I'll just cut to the punchline. It's basically the thesis, the thesis statement of this talk. Uh, an open research lab is uh, a research group that engages directly with the market, that works via open collaboration, and that uses these to close the feedback loop between ideas and practice and to close that feedback loop faster. Um, so that's basically what we do at Mozilla Research. Uh, and I think it's an interesting model. I don't claim at all that it's the only model for research. I think there are many important models. Uh, there are pros and cons to all of them. But I think this is one that's maybe underappreciated, underexplored. So it's one I want to talk to you a little bit about today. Um, and I think it's been pretty effective. So Heather mentioned some of these. Uh, uh, it was very kind of you. Um, I'm, I'm pretty proud of, of what we've accomplished at Mozilla. Uh, we have the Rust programming language, which is doing quite well. We have the uh, Servo browser engine, which is younger than Rust, but making good progress. Uh, we spearheaded the asm.js subset of JavaScript uh, and have been uh, playing a leadership role in the WebAssembly initiative. Uh, we also have an, an initiative that's uh, uh, working on patent unencumbered high quality video codecs. So we're not all about in my head of how research works, but I, at least I got a glimpse of, of how that works. Um, so really what I want to talk about today is my learning process going from the academic world uh, from uh, N years to a PhD, I'm not going to tell you uh, the value of N, um, to uh, about six and a half years now that I've been working full time at Mozilla. Um, and it's been a fascinating learning process for me to watch how my own axioms have shifted over the years where I still have some of the things that I've learned from academia but the things that I'm trying to accomplish are very different, and that's changed my thought process. Um, so uh, when I came to Mozilla, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I'm not going to try to sell you some like crystalline gem of, of, a, of a model that came fully formed from my head. Um, all I knew when I came to Mozilla was that I had this intuition that uh, research and Mozilla's culture of open source, of open collaboration, um, might be able to work well together. I might be able to put that to good use for Mozilla. It might have strategic value for what Mozilla was trying to accomplish. And a few of us at Mozilla had some interesting experiments we wanted to try. So little by little, we started building what you might call uh, an open research lab. Um, uh, if this is a term, uh, I, languages, I'm actually not going to talk about that one today, but I'm happy to talk to people more about that. And in fact, um, Michael Bebenita is here and uh, heavily involved in that project if anyone wants to hear more about that one. Um, so I think for a relatively small research lab with a pretty small budget, we've been able to accomplish some pretty big things. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we do what we do, uh, which means it's not going to be a very technical talk. This is really more about um, my way of thinking. Um, so that, that learning process that I talked about, um, I think for me, a lot of it centers around how do you actually get software adoption? Because what we're trying to do in engaging with the market in building open source ecosystems is actually build software for adoption. We're trying to do innovative things. We're trying to do research, but we're trying to do it by building real stuff that people really use. Um, so for me, coming from an academic background, a lot of this has been about learning how reality works, which I didn't know as much as I thought I did about. So I think of this as sort of discovering the laws of nature. Um, and the laws are not always pretty. Um, the, law, the laws sometimes really contradict what I would like to be true. Um, and uh, what's, what, part of what happens in that mental shift over time is instead of looking at these, um, I, I really believe that research and practice have a lot to teach each other. Um, so uh, it's. But it's not easy. And I think, I think one of the reasons why it's hard for uh, the two worlds to talk to each other is they kind of start from different axioms or um, they, have, they have different incentives behind what they're trying to do. So generally speaking, researchers uh, are rewarded for novelty. That's the thing that they're trying to do is, is come up with new things. Um, and uh, if it can have impact, that's great. And I think basically everybody's here because you're interested in impact. But you're not necessarily rewarded for impact all the time. Um, and it's basically the opposite when it comes to, uh, to industry. In industry, like, we just have to survive to like, let our businesses live another day. Um, if that works with an old idea, if that works with a new idea, we honestly don't care as long as we survive. Um, but 
I'm here because I think that new ideas can also be one particular way uh, for us to, to succeed in industry. So the two have um, kind of can meet at the at the point of novelty, but um, but they don't always uh, know how to speak each other's languages. Um, also, I think my story is a little bit relevant because I started out in the academic world. I'm now in the industry world. I've sort of been on both sides of the fence. At least I, I was a baby academic. I got as far as, as my PhD. So I may still have kind of an infantile version uh, Can people hear me? Wow, okay, perfect. So maybe, hey, let's get started. Um, so we're very lucky to have Dave Herman here from uh, Mozilla Research, who is the director of strategy for Mozilla Research. <laughs> I knew it was a director of some kind. I just wanted to make sure. Um, and he's been involved in you know, a little language called Rust, which everybody takes a lot of inspiration from in this room. Um, and a lot of other little pro little projects like Servo ASM ASMJS is also one of the projects underneath the umbrella of Mozilla Research. So he's quite uh, he's you know this is organization has their hands in quite a few interesting and important open source projects, uh, and also uh, effective JavaScript. So if you use JavaScript, you probably read his book. Uh, so we're really lucky to have him here, and he's going to talk to us today a little bit about Open Source Research Lab at Mozilla. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Um, it's hard to tell if the mic is on. You can hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, all right. This is really exciting for me. Um, Curry On is, uh, uh, has a theme that, that speaks to me. Uh, 